This is the Coping as an HR Department of One with Michelle Brott, Courtney Strutt Todd, and Jana Wheeler um, with the Davis Brown Law Firm. Meg Kistner is going to introduce them. So, Meg, take it away. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce the Davis Brown Law Firm. Michelle is a forward thinking, practical employment attorney. Her first goal is to help her clients, including multi state employers small businesses, startups, corporations, franchises, and municipalities avoid litigation. When that's not an option, she's ready to defend them before the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Iowa Workforce Development, and other administrative bodies all the way through trial. Courtney is a shareholder at Davis Brown and began in 2006 with tax employment benefits, employee benefits and finance as her primary areas of practice. Courtney also has a practice in general business matters including but not limited to two, forming all types of business entities and preparation and review of contracts and policies. Jana is a shareholder helping individuals, families, and nonprofit and charitable or organizations with estate planning, administration of estates and trusts, guardianships and conservatorships. She also assists businesses and organizations with ERISA compliance and employee retirement benefits. So let's welcome Michelle, Courtney, and Jana. Hi, this is uh, Courtney Strutt Todd from Davis Brown Law Firm. Um, as kind of the everything that was said in the intro is already true, but I am also uh, work very heavily on our firm's 401k plan ourselves and fixing and answering questions related to many different types of plans. I also this year wore a different hat and became the PPP loan expert um, in our firm. So I'm dealing with all kinds of those questions as well. Jana? Yes, yeah, so I work in both estate planning and in ERISA benefits. And so this is kind of where my, my two worlds meet in a lot of different areas. Um, there's a lot more overlap than I think people would expect. I've also, I also currently serve on our firm's retirement committee. Um, so I'm also working on, on this from the employer side as well. Um, so our next slide is going to be our usual uh, lawyers always have to give a disclaimer. So the reminder here is that the information we are providing is as a reference. Every um, situation is very fact specific. And so you should always get it, um, your own legal advice if you have a specific situation. Okay, hopefully I'm speaking louder. I've moved my computer. I was told I was maybe pretty soft in my opening. Um, so hopefully this is better. Um, Tips for employee relations. So this is really my world, right? Advising you all as employee issues come up on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my tips are the first one is always consistent but flexible. Um, what that means is that we want to both uh, recognize that employee relation matters are um, always going to turn on the facts, right? We, want, we don't want to gloss over the fact investigation. But what's important to remember is that every time you make a decision, you know, are we going to let this uh, exempt employee, uh, let's say that you let them make up time after, after work or flex their hours so they don't have to take PTO. If you start doing that, you've created some level of precedent, right? So then if you deny it to another em employee, then you're being potentially inconsistent, right? So we want to be consistent but flexible so that we are addressing our realistic expectations is always very important. And that's in incredibly important in the pandemic world and in the telework world, um, whether you've returned your staff to the office or whether they're remote and displaced across the state, um, we need to have realistic expectations about productivity. Um, that has been the undercurrent of the pandemic is giving us this idea that we can I'm being told maybe you can't hear me at all, um, that there's this idea that we can be productive even though we're in the remote workforce. Um, uh, training is also incredibly important. So when, you, when you're in charge of an HR department, you've got to ensure that the people below you or the people you're working with, managers and other folks who have the interaction with the employees are just as trained as you are on receiving employee concerns, what's gonna trigger civil rights, what's gonna tri trigger discipline, and how the HR employment laws interrelate to what they're hearing. Um, it can be very difficult for um, 
individuals to think, oh, I've just heard an HR concern. I better just, I better just leave that to HR. But there's a lot of times where it's incredibly important if somebody brings a harassment complaint or a, uh, a protected complaint, then if they, if they bring that to any other manager in the organization, it's considered as if the organization has heard it. So the training so that your, your managers and your other individuals with authority can issue spot is critical. And the last tip is solid policies. Policies are terrible to keep up with. Um, it's difficult to keep an updated handbook. It's difficult to know what's in your handbook, um, but that is one of the best ways that you can control, mitigate risk and provide an even playing field for the employees. Um, it's no fun to write the employee handbook, but once it's written, make sure you have it, make sure it's tr your training on it and make sure people know what it is. Um, when you've got a solid employee handbook, that's the playbook of the game. Everyone knows the rules. And when you get a, a crazy situation with an employee that feels like it's going to you know, take up your entire morning, you should be able to refer to those policies to give you some level of understanding as to your next step. And relating to the documentation on the employee benefits side, um, documentation is also very important. The th kind of the theme here, which I think relays from what Michelle was saying, is you really need to plan ahead and keep organized. So on the benefits side, a lot of times what we see is if there's a question relating to say um, like the 401k plan, one of the first questions from an attorney or from an accountant is going to be, what do, you, what do your plan documents say? And so those plan documents need to be in a clear um, location that the appropriate person knows where to find them. Um, and we would think this goes without saying, but you need signed copies of those documents. You as the employer are responsible to have those documents and to be able to prove what your documents say. And so, it seems so simple, but just knowing where that file is, particularly if there's a transition between um, employees within a department, um, one employee leaves or retires to be able to, to transfer that onto the next person and clearly say, here's the folder of not just the current documents, but prior documents as well. Relating to that, knowing what your role and responsibilities as the employer are. A lot of times, if not most, small employers are working with a TPA, a third party administrator. You need to know the difference between your roles and responsibilities and theirs. Um, typically, a lot of things still fall on you. And so you need to know who is responsible for updating that plan document, keeping up with the laws. And that's gonna come down to the agreement you have between you and your TPA. And then Courtney, are you here? I had a message that she got booted. So Okay. Can I'll you, do can the Can you hear me now? Yes, we oh, can. Goodness. All yours. Okay. Sorry, I got disconnected. So okay. <laughs> So for, as far as outsourcing and uh, TPAs, we highly encourage the use of TPAs. And that's generally just because it is uh, so hard to follow all the rules associated with, especially 401k plans and things like that. So um, typically, you know, just as a reminder that you as a fiduciary, the company is fiduciary, fiduciarily responsible for carrying out the employee benefits plans. So even if you get a TPA and outsource, you might not be outsourcing that fiduciary responsibility um, unless you specifically contract to do that. So it's important to know what, when you use a TPA, what duties you're having them do and not do so you know what you're responsible for. Um, as far as reporting goes, ERISA has lots and lots of reporting and disclosure requirements, which is why it's, again, good to use a third-party administrator or TPA and outsource those duties. Typically, that includes uh, yearly summary plan descriptions, fee disclosure notices, and other notices relating to benefit changes. There's an annual filing of a 5500 form for 401k plans. Um, and there's also lots of rules that uh, contributions under the plan cannot discriminate in favor of highly compensated employees. There's all kinds of rules related to that. And the testing can be uh, very highly complicated. So it's just important to make sure you're not uh, messing with some of those rules. 
there's also, um, you know, everybody makes mistakes on their plans. Everybody does. And the most important thing to know is that if there's a mistake made on a plan, um, it can change and violate the tax exemption status of the plan, which causes all kinds of fees to your employees and the employers and penalties. So in order, when mistakes happen and they're going to happen, it's just important to make sure they're properly corrected, which is where JNI in particular help um, most uh, companies, most employers, and most TPAs deal with those kind of corrections. A lot of times, if it's easy, you can do it by yourself without involving the IRS. So you can make a correction, but you need to do it correctly in one of the prescribed manners that the IRS says you have to do it. And if it's a really bad one, sometimes it does involve um, filing an application with the IRS and kind of making sure that that gets corrected so you don't violate your plan. Okay, we want to put this into application for you a little bit today and not just talk at you about the law. So um, we've got some hypotheticals and it's going to result, we're going to revolve around an employee that we've named Pat. And your employee, Pat, has gone through a lot over the last couple of years and we're going to go through that adventure with him. So the first is on bar onboarding. Um, so your new employee, Pat, started in the mailroom as a technician in March. And for your employee benefits, what do you need to do to cover in onboarding? And you then also hear from other employees that Pat is telling people he's having an affair with the vice president of finance. What do you do? Courtney? All right. So, yeah, I'll cover the employee benefits. I'll leave Michelle to the fun question about the affair. But um, as far as employee benefits and onboarding, boarding, you just want to make sure that you have – your employees, when they come, are aware of all of your benefits and your retirement plans. Um, for retirement plans in, in particular, you want to make sure you give them a copy of the plan and a summary plan doc document. If they're eligible to start contributing to plans, you want to make sure that they have all the election forms they need. Some plans will say that they have to, they are, will automatically be entered and part of their salary will automatically be contributed. So you want your employee to know if they can elect out of that so that they get their full salary if they don't want it, to use that benefit. And then there's other benefits that include things like signing handbooks, assigning tax documents, withholding documents, training on policies and procedures, and making sure that they also get copies of health plans and elections for those other types of benefits as well. Okay, so we've heard a rumor about uh, a mailroom technician having an affair with the vice president. Um, if you've heard a rumor, you may have actual knowledge. Even though it doesn't feel like somebody brought this forward as a complaint or a concern or a report, if you hear a rumor, you should check in on this. The most important reason you want to check in on this is because we've set this up to be a power differentiated relationship. We've got a brand new employee they're in a mailroom type position, and we've got the vice president of finance who presumably is going to have more authority than a mailroom tech, right? So when you've got these difficult um, relationships, don't just hear a rumor and move on with it. We have to make sure this is um, consensual. We have to make sure that there's not the, uh, a risk that when these two break up, even if it starts consensual, when you've got somebody in a management vice president or vice pre, uh, president type of situation or title, they have strict liability against the company. So this may be incredibly consensual, but it still reeks of risk. You want to check and see what your policies say about you know, office dating and relationships, and you want to determine whether this is something that can continue. Now, we see issues like this where relationships between adults are completely consensual, but then when they go south, they come into the workplace and we're adopting that risk. Um, so the lesson to take away from this is one, a rumor might be an actual report and two, watch power differentiated relationships because they have the potential to turn into sex harassment claims, hostile work environment, and can create risk for the organization. Okay. For our next one, um, we're, we'll, we're still dealing with that same employee. So now we learned that Pat has a gambling problem. And so he has approached the company or the plan asking to withdraw funds from his 401k to help cover the debts. And so the question is, can he do that for his financial troubles? Uh, there are a couple ways that an employee is allowed to withdraw from their 401k plan. 
the simplest and most obvious is at retirement. We are assuming he hasn't hit that yet because under our fact situation, he's still working for us. So that no longer applies. Um, in other situations, he would be able to withdraw prior to retirement. However, he's likely going to pay a 10% penalty plus the tax to do that. There are, under certain situations, what's called a hardship withdrawal. And if he could fit that fact situation, he would be allowed to make that withdrawal. However, here, given the facts for something like a gambling problem, he likely does not fit the definition of hardship. Um, so his potential only option here would be to, to take a loan from his 401k. So that's a loan that he would have to pay back. Typically, you know, he would want to compare the fees. It's probably going to be high fees. And he should also be aware that if he leaves employment, typically that entire loan comes due. So that's something that he would need to be aware of. But under these factual situations, the money in his 401k is likely not going to be of great benefit for him in recovering from this, this gambling problem. So what I have to add from an employee relations and labor and employment standpoint on this is if you find out an employee has this sort of personal problem, what we're hearing is not a protected issue. Um, gam problem gambling is not typically going to be protected. Um, unlike, you know, for instance, a disability or a mental illness. Um, what you should be doing is you can determine whether you've got EAP, right? Employee assistance programs that you can refer Pat to or provide some level of um, support that way. If Pat's the CFO and not a mailroom tech, you might have a conflict of interest. Um, you might have a concern that this gambling problem is gonna create um, an incentive for Pat to engage in embezzlement. And you might need to take further action about that. But spotting those issues and checking your policies about what you do if you have a uh, conflict of interest and being aware that you have EAP. Normally, that's a free benefit that comes with your payroll system um, and having that tool. So if Pat comes to you and lays out these gambling concerns, you've got something tangible that you can provide that employee that gives them the support, but also removes you from the situation because this is typically a non-employer problem. Courtney? Yeah, so Jana kind of touched a little bit on, um, you know, some of these things about if, if the plan gets terminated, what happens? So if you do have a loan outstanding uh, and you get terminated, you would need, the employee would need to pay that back. And typically they have to pay it back within a really quick timeline, like 30 to 60 days, um, or it becomes a distribution, which is taxable and not something that they would want to happen. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing about um, if you get terminated is really what happens. You have money in a 401k. If you haven't taken it out, it's still sitting there. The plan dictates really a lot about what you can do with that. Um, a lot of times, you know, if you get if you get fired, you can you can take distributions. They're going to be taxable. They might be subject to a 10% penalty if you are under age 59 and a half. A lot of times, you can roll over the funds into an IRA or another plan if you get a job somewhere else. Sometimes there's something also called a mandatory cash out, which usually only applies if you have under a certain amount, like $5,000 in the account. And the plan can say they can automatically cash that out and write, uh, make you take that out of the plan, which would be taxable unless you turn it into another um, tax exempt plan or an IRA. So those are, that's kind of the impact on Pat if he's terminated. Okay, so for this next one, Pat, he's just doing all kinds of things. He then next files a complaint with the Iowa Civil Rights Commission claiming that he has been discriminated against because of his age. What do you do? Okay, so the most important thing that you do is um, you, you do something, right? You don't set that aside. If this is the very first time you've heard of an age complaint, which certainly today, this was the first time we threw age in here, um, if you're surprised by an Iowa Civil Rights Commission filing, that means you need to investigate it. And that's a different investigation than the one that your attorney does when you give them that document and say, there's a civil rights complaint. You want to have your internal investigation and you want to have your attorney investigation. Don't blend those two together. And that's a common mistake. And it can come back to be a very 
substantial and significant error in the litigation. Um, so what you want to do is you want to check with your broker and find out if you have insurance to cover Iowa civil rights filings. You may. It's called employment practices liability insurance, and it's very oftentimes paired with um, kind of business policies. So some folks are surprised to know they have it. Um, but that's the first thing you want to do is you want to be sure that you have an internal investigation. You want to be sure you've alerted your insurance company. And then you want to get connected either with your company attorney or with the attorney your insurance company will provide for you. Um, it's very important when you get this Iowa Civil Rights Commission to also do a litigation hold. Litigation hold is where we're going to hold all of our emails and all of our tangible documents and text messages. Text messages on either personal or company phones that relate to Pat. Um, it is critical that we preserve those text messages because a failure to do so can also be a significant error in the litigation and result in penalties from a court. As we all know, text messages, they're vulnerable. They can disappear, they can delete, people drop their phones. And so when we're trying to find text messages that could be very helpful to defending it against a claim a year later or two years later, it's almost impossible. So when you get that complaint, it's incredibly important to make sure that litigation hold gets in place. Um, almost as important as ensuring that your insurance knows about it because they also have some short time frames for notification on these types of, of claims. So you want to be sure that you put that litigation hold in place and that you alert the insurer. Jana? And then from the employee benefits side, um, if this does turn into some sort of lawsuit from Pat against the company, if there are any sort of um, wages that end up being recovered, it is very important to consider the impact of the 401k on that. Um, you likely want to have someone with benefits and tax knowledge um, involved to review any settlements and certainly your attorney can assist with that. We, we've seen that a couple times that as part of the settlement, you know, the employee is saying, well, in addition to these wages, I want X. Certain um, salary payments that are coming back can have an impact on the 401k. And you have very specific plan documents and very specific rules that must need to be followed. And so just because the employee says he wants a certain thing, he wants a contribution into his 401k, doesn't mean that that's allowed under the plan. And so failure to correctly follow the plan can cause issues for the entire 401k plan. Um, in the employee benefits arena, we also have anti-discrimination policies. Ours are very different than what Michelle's are. So typically the discrimination policies uh, or rules for purposes of a 401k, they deal more with highly compensated employees, whether highly compensated employees are getting treated better than the non-highly compensated employees. Um, and then similarly, whether the types of benefits that we are providing to them. So the matching, the deferral percentages. One way to get around that is a lot of plans follow a safe harbor that you don't have to check on this all the time. Instead, you follow a safe harbor. So admittedly, that was a stretch to get in our ability to talk about the anti-discrimination. Um, but Michelle's scenarios are just a lot more fun than what uh, Courtney and I are. So we had to stretch to get that one in there. They're only fun when we're in a conference room or, or a setting like this, and it's not your actual employees, right? They're good stories, but we don't want to live them. Um, and the next one is um, some marijuana use. Believe it or not, at the beginning of this year, something happened that was that one of our neighboring states um, made recreational marijuana legal. We don't remember that because there's been a global pandemic and a presidential election that's ongoing and all those other types of things that have been has distracted our attention. But when we're back to traveling more frequently and when we're living our lives as normal, this may be an actual problem, right? When somebody ventures across the border because we have a neighboring state that allows for recreational use. So Pat went to training across state lines in Moline and Pat accepted a vendor's offer to try some marijuana lace brownies. After his random drug test, when he returns, he explains to you that he didn't want to be rude, so he ate the brownie. What do you do? Um, well, if you, have a, if you have a policy that allows for drug testing, and it says that you follow your policy, some people give a, a one chance and you, can, and you lose your job, 
or you can give them an ch- opportunity to, you know, go to uh, therapy or, or rehab rather, and they can return. You can give them a five day suspension. You can term them on the second one, whatever your policy says. Um, but it is totally fine to terminate an employee if they re- have a drug test in Iowa, even if at the time it was, it was lawful consumption of uh, recreational uh, marijuana. So uh, we suspect that when we go back to traveling the world and, and enjoying each other's company, that these are the types of issues that are gonna come up, um, but notwithstanding it remains unlawful in the state of Iowa. And if you choose to terminate, you're free to do so. Courtney? Yeah, and, and as Michelle was talking about, this actually happened. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I had some, I'll say, college clients in Iowa who there was a big conference in Colorado. Uh, They were all supposed to meet with a vendor and a vendor took them to a place that um, sold marijuana laced uh, food. So um, then they had to decide the employees uh, whether to just not eat, (laughs) sit there through the event or what to do. So it does really happen. Um, But from a, uh, uh, an employment a retirement perspective, you know, in this case, I guess, uh, you know, I'll turn it a little bit and say Pat um, maybe has a drug problem, not just doing this stuff, but has a drug problem, running out of money. How does he get money out of his uh, retirement if he needs it? And this is just to kind of further expand. We've talked about this a little bit before, but talk more about specifically what a hardship distribution is. And um, uh, to get to be able to get a hardship distribution from a plan, um, you really have to have an immediate and heavy financial need. Um, and you can, and the reason you do a hardship distribution is because you can only make withdrawals for a few reasons in a plan, death, disability, severance from employment, termination, or you've reached retirement age. Other than that, you need some kind of reason to be able to take money out if it's not in the form of a loan. And so that's immediate and heavy financial need. And, and, um, you know, this is limited, the amount that you could take out. It has to be for real reasons. The safe harbor reasons are like medical care for you and your family, purchase of a principal residence. It would not be to support your drug habit. However, if Pat is getting evicted from his home or going to be evicted from his home, those may be the reasons that potentially he could use a hardship distribution and get that out. Now, those are still subject to a 10% penalty, so that's not good, and we don't want necessarily uh, people or the employees taking money out for those reasons, but that's uh, something he could do and some access to funds that he could have. Okay, and this is a, a certainly timely one. I feel like we almost were hiding the ball on this one, but we wanted to make sure we got hit some of the other highlights. Um, so under this situation, Pat is currently receiving treatments for cancer and is high risk for COVID-19. He has requested ADA accommodations so he can continue to work at your company, but to do so safely and minimize his risk for COVID-19. The question is, what do you do? And if he can no longer work, what are his rights under his retirement plan? Okay, so a disability um, accommodation is a messy nonlinear analysis. If you have never done one before, you should reach out to an experienced labor and employment attorney to walk you through it because it's a trap for the weary. Um, You want to first and foremost have a conversation with your employee to determine if they have a disability. A disability, a legal disability has a definition if it's a substantial uh, uh, impairment such that you're unable to work. And if they have a legal disability, they're entitled to a reasonable accommodation to perform the essential functions of the job. Not an accommodation of their choice, but a reasonable one, and one that allows them to perform the essential functions. Um, Certainly, we all know that telework is going to be, um, the EEOC has said they're not going to say just because you let employees telework during the pandemic, that that's proof that you should always let employees telework if they request that in the future. That's nice of them to say, and I appreciate that memo that they put out, but I don't think that it's going to be as clean as that going forward. So telework has always been sort of a a, a dicey issue for when employers are not in favor of having a remote workforce, Um, but those types of accommodations can very easily be deemed reasonable by a court or by the EEOC or the Iowa Civil Rights Commission. 
Um, the other piece of this that I want to pull out that has been a trap for the weary that's really important, particularly in the pandemic, you know, the insurance companies that I work for have sent out any number of memos that they are expecting an explosion of claims after the pandemic or as people start to sort of normalize. Um, and a big area of where those claims are predicted is in the disability accommodations area. And that's because a lot of people are trying to be nice, but they're doing the wrong thing. So here, Pat is high risk for something, or Pat ha is over the age of 60, that would make him high risk. Or let's say Pat is female and Pat is pregnant. These types of protected categories are also ways to be higher risk for COVID-19. As the employer, we do not decide for that person that they should not return to the office or that they should telework or how that high risk factor impacts their employment. Instead, the employee gets to decide. So in this case, Pat has come to you. And it's a difference. Pat raised his own hand. We don't raise Pat's hand for him. And that is a critical difference because when we raise his hand for him, we, we've stepped into liability. However, when he raises his own hand and asks for an accommodation, that's when we go through that interactive process and find out what we can do to help him work um, and, and stay as safe as possible during this particular time. Um, it, another piece that I'll throw in just sort of gratuitously is what's also difficult for employers right now is when people are saying they're too nervous to come to work. We've moved past some of that in the pandemic, but we still have people who are uncomfortable doing in-person uh, work, even if the job calls for it. So there's, that's a fine line to determine whether somebody is sort of telling you they have a mental illness that's being exacerbated by the stress, anxiety of the pandemic or they're saying it's a preference and you have, it's your obligation. The law says it's your obligation to drill down and determine whether that is somebody's preference or if that's their way of starting a conversation about their mental illness, which is a protected conversation. Um, so like I started, it's very messy. It can be very complicated. And if you've got these issues and you're, you're not used to dealing with disability accommodations, please do reach out or, or call your experienced labor and employment attorney so that you have somebody to guide you through it. So yeah, from the um, retirement plan side, we've talked about some of these other things, but the what we wanted to hit here was, you know, there's only a few reasons you can make distributions from the plan. One of them is for disability and disability under definitions under retirement plans are very se severe. Um, this, this refers to, you know, something with severe brain damage, loss of multiple limbs, so not just one, loss of speech. Courtney, are you there? Uh oh, Courtney, we can't hear you. Okay, okay. we might we might okay. have to pause on that. I don't. I want. She might have got kicked out. We will um, move on. Or Dana, do you know the rest of that? That, or do you want to move on? Um, no, I, I can hit on a couple pieces, and then if Courtney comes back, she can add to it. Um, so there's a couple areas that we can talk about here. So Courtney was mentioning what the actual definition of, a, of disability is under a plan. Um, in addition to all of the disability pieces of it, there's also under the CARES Act, there were some changes made this year that do impact retirement plans. Um, and there's a couple big ones in this area. So one of them is that they have added a category allowing distributions or withdrawal, I should say, from a 401k plan that can be taken due to COVID. And so there's a definition that you have to fit in, and I'm not going to try to go through all the pieces of it, but essentially it's if you were diagnosed with COVID, if your spouse or a dependent was diagnosed with COVID, or if you were financially impacted from COVID, which is generally a reduction in hours. If any of those applied, you are allowed to pull from your 401k plan without being subject to that 10% penalty. Um, a piece of that is also, you have the ability to pay that back. So typically when you pull from your 401k, it is subject to income tax. Under the CARES Act, if you can pay that back over the next three years, you do not have to pay the income tax on it. So 
it, that's going to be interesting to see. It's going to get a little messy with tax returns because right now somebody probably doesn't know if they're going to be able to pay that back over the next couple of years. But that's not nearly as much of a concern for the employer side of it, but know that that might be something your employees are going to ask about. Similarly, there was the, an increased ability to borrow, to take a loan from your 401k. Um, the original provision that was put into place actually expired in September. So typically the maximum amount of loan you can take from your 401k is 50,000. That was temporarily increased to 100,000. That expired in September, but there has already been discussion of what that may get extended through the end of the year. So that's not something that has happened yet, but it could happen as you know the pandemic is clearly still going on. Um, the final piece under the CARES Act is that if you had a loan already, you had certain repayment requirements. That is set out by your plan document. If the employee had taken a loan, they have to make um, repayment within a certain amount of time. The CARES Act suspended loan repayments that were due through the end of this year. So for somebody who had already taken a loan that should have had to make a payment, that has been extended. Um, so again, something just for your employees to be aware as they maybe are going into financial hardship, these are some of the things that are out there in relation to their 401k benefits. Okay, well, flip to this is actually our last hypothetical. I'm not 100% sure how much time we have left, um, maybe just a couple minutes um, and four minutes. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll make short work out of this, but it's a good one that um, with an employee fatality. So Pat's employee, now Pat has some employees. Um, Vanna was killed in a workplace accident. Pat had asked Vanna to repair a sign 15 feet in the air and Vanna used a ladder instead of scaffolding and she fell and died. Um, what do the employer and Pat do next? What I wanna tell you from a litigation and a risk mitigation standpoint is I wanna just introduce the, the notion that outside of workers' comp, obviously this employees was lost their life during their job, performance of their duties, so there's work comp liability. There's also what's called gross negligence of coworkers and even supervisors. So in this case, if Pat directed that this sign be put up and that Vanna did it in an unsafe way, there is a cause of action where an individual manager is liable. And this has come up a few times. It has been used more frequently in the state of Iowa in the last couple of years than it had been before. So when there's an employee fatality for your issue spotting matrix and for your information, there are claims and liability outside of workers' comp. And you should take the time to, to discuss that either with your insurer or with your attorney as those issues develop. And then I'll kick it to you, Jana, on the distributions. Yep, so for the distributions, we, we see this a lot. Again, this is where my two worlds meet. I do the estate planning and probate side of things and the employee benefits. And particularly for smaller employers that know our employees really well, we, we want to be accommodating to the, the family members or the surviving family of our deceased um, employee. And so the biggest piece here though, is it is so important to follow the plan documents and if there is a beneficiary designation. Um, I have seen it more than once where the employer tells a, you know, a surviving spouse, yep, you are the, this, you know, this is what the beneficiary designation says. And then come to find out they had the wrong, uh, a prior beneficiary designation. So it is so important to know where your beneficiary designations are, those should be on file, and to just to make sure that you follow those rules. Um, even if you know the family, you can't stretch the rules and just make an accommodation and say, well, we know that they only had these, the employee only had these two adult kids, and so we'll just, we'll, it can get paid out to them. You have to follow the rules. Related to that um, it would be like a final paycheck and the other kind of items that you have. Again, you need to know a little bit about the situation and you just need to be hesitant to just hand those over to anybody. You need to make sure that we have the right person that we are paying that paycheck over to, even if you think you know their family situation. Um, so I think we are about out of time, but we are happy to take questions for at least a minute if anybody has any. I don't see any in the chat yet. 
Um, otherwise, it can be difficult to participate in Zoom presentations. So we've left our emails and, you know, we're always happy to chat offline um, about these issues. They're very important. And when they come up for you, we know how much stress and uncertainty they can cause. So, you know, hopefully what we've provided for you all today is some level of a roadmap. So when these issues arise in your place of employment, um, that uh, you've got some idea of where to start and where it can go.